Uh, hey, we are in part six of our fall series here on the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, it's been uh, an awesome time just hearing from our, our different pastors and uh, just sort of together as a church family deep diving. And then uh, if you've had a chance to get in on the growth groups, uh, we'll both talk about what was discussed in the message on the Sunday. And then there's a great uh, guide that we've been going through to go a little bit deeper on each fruit of the Spirit. So uh, we're on six of nine. We're getting through. Uh, let me take a look uh, again at our uh, theme verse that we're working from, Galatians 5:22 to 23. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. This morning we'll be uh, getting into goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, against such, there is no law. So uh, as we look at goodness here today, I just want to pause and remind us of the context uh, that we're working from as we look at all of this. Uh, and it's, it's an important context to keep in mind uh, for, for all of our uh, discipleship, for all of our walking out this journey of being disciples of Christ. And, and so a couple of uh, things here for our context. Uh, this, all, this, this fruit of the Spirit is not something that we are called upon to in and of ourselves manufacture for the Lord. It's not behavior that he's expecting us to kind of pull up by our bootstraps and just go ahead and, and do this on our own. The, the starting point is salvation. The starting point is Christ uh, is received. We meet him at the cross, call him Lord and Savior of our lives, surrender to him, and then Holy Spirit moves on the inside. And so, so when we look at what, what the biblical context is, uh, it, it begins with relationship with God. It begins with receiving uh, the gift of salvation that, that, that's been given to us. So, so to be clear, salvation is not reformation. There are times that we do need to reform. There's times where we do need reformation. But salvation is much bigger than that. It's regeneration. It's becoming something brand new that we weren't before. So the fruit of the Spirit comes out of that context, and it's so easy for us as human beings, and maybe certain personalities than others, like one like mine, uh, to move into works first. And, and what you're going to hear as we get into this, uh, this area, this fruit of goodness, works are not to be dismissed or thrown out. Works are in evidence. Works uh, are a fruit. But it, we, we can't ever get it backward. And when we get it backward, uh, it starts to mess up our walk with God. How many have been there like me where you've gotten it backward, right? And it's like, no, nah, I got I to gotta keep this straightened out. Um, so changes in us are not due to hard efforts on our part, but they're due to the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So that, that's where the, the change in our life is coming from. The transformation in our lives is not due to our own striving, but rather our surrender to the Holy Spirit's voice and work and presence and guidance in us. So with that understanding that it's salvation first, that it's not striving, but it's uh, submitting uh, to the Lord, uh, we do need to cooperate with him. Uh, and that surrendering needs to include listening and obeying when he instructs. And yes, it may require uh, effort on our part. It might uh, require some struggle on our part, uh, but it's a cooperation with the work that he is doing. And we got to make sure that we keep that straight as we're walking through this awesome journey with him. So, uh, so in that context, a couple of things that are listed out in your note sheet if you want to follow along. We want to deep dive here on this, this fruit of goodness and what is it and how has it worked out in our lives. So number one uh, is goodness defined. Let's define the word goodness because we know we, we live in a world, uh, Scripture tells us, that we'll call evil good and good evil. Right? So we have to watch who we're going to as a source. But let me ask a question. When you think of goodness, what comes to mind? Uh, do we think of deeds or actions? Uh, is it, does what you do determine if you're a good person? Uh, or is there more to it than that? Um, 
one of our problems with goodness is the same problem with the word love. We use it in so many different contexts, right? We can uh, love our children and love apple pie and love a beautiful sunset, but each of those loves are entirely different. It's the same with the word good. We can say that was a, a good movie. We can say I had a good meal. Uh, we could say I met a good person, or there's some of us here who have said, had a good cry. You know, just needed to have a good cry, right? We've heard that, that terminology. But again, all those uses of goodness are different, aren't they? So Matthew uh, 7, let's look at a couple of verses. Verse 17 and 18, Jesus says, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So there's a, a, a biblical usage talking about good fruit, bad fruit. Romans 12, 20 to 21 uh, says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Notice in particular in verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we look in, in those verses there, good fruit, bad fruit. We look at overcoming evil with good. So let's start to paint out a picture of what goodness is from a biblical perspective. And again, if you're following along, you can, uh, you, you know, jot this in your notes. So first of all, goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. Now, I suppose we could do the right thing for the wrong reason, uh, and the wrong thing for the right reason. I've done both. Anybody else? You know, but how many know you need both to be right in order for it to be goodness? You know, I've had times where it's like you did the, the right thing, but I know why you did it, and you did it for the wrong reason. And so it's not goodness, right? Um, another aspect of goodness is uprightness of heart and life. So this means that goodness includes abstaining from every appearance of evil, uprightness of heart, and uprightness of life, a life that's an honest one, one that can be admired. So true goodness, you know, we talked about is it deeds, true goodness comes from the heart. And that's where Holy Spirit is working. That's where that fruit is coming from. It's coming from a heart place. Uh, so. Uh, another aspect of goodness here in, in this, this thought of uprightness of heart is sometimes goodness includes rebuking, correcting, and chastising, right? The Lord disciplines those he loves, you know? So there's an aspect of goodness uh, that, that includes that. Um, when we think of kindness, this aspect is not often thought of, but there are times where for the benefit of the person, it is displaying goodness toward them to correct and rebuke and chastise. Uh, another way we could uh, kind of paint out this picture of goodness is uh, understanding that it's spirit-created, moral, and spiritual excellence. And, and key in that is spirit-created. So uh, moral goodness basically means conforming to God's ways and God's principles. Moral goodness, uh, conforming to his ways and his principles. And so as Holy Spirit grows in us, we're able to become uh, a better person, a person of more goodness. We can more easily do what's best for others. Uh, we know, right, Jesus sometimes asks us to do difficult things that display the God kind of goodness. Things like love our enemies, bless those that curse us. Jesus said, and when you pray, forgive, right? We know he didn't say when you pray, I wanna suggest that maybe you consider thinking about maybe forgiving, right? It's not a suggestion, it is a command. And when you stand praying, forgive. And so in the natural, for the, the solical mind, for the flesh nature, certainly uh, there are times where, you, you know, uh, goodness is confronted by things where we're not in our own, uh, you, you know, humanness. We're not going to be able to walk out that goodness, which is why God gives us this fruit, which is why Holy Spirit lives on the inside. And, and even though it's difficult in the natural, we can, we can walk out God's goodness. Uh, and then I, I, I love this. Um, goodness is expressing the attributes that define God's goodness. 
right? So, so we can just take a step back and say, all right, well, what makes God a good God? It's, it's one of the attributes that makes him God. And it's things like uh, he's pure, he's holy. Again, he's forgiving. He's generous. Uh, he loves righteousness and justice. You know, so all of these are aspects of God's goodness. That, that's not an exhaustive list, but that just puts a little picture together for us. So, so the idea is that we would walk out uh, and express his attributes to the world so that the world can more readily see who he is. Uh, and then in a world that is very confused about what's good and what's evil, uh, it shows them a picture of God's heart about these things. And then just uh, another thought on this, uh, what, what is a definition of goodness? We could just say in a simplest form, it's something that pleases God. Amen. And it's something we see all over scripture, starting back in Genesis with creation, creating the heavens and the earth and uh, life in, uh, in the sea and the air on the ground. And after each part of it, right, God uh, said, it is good. It is good. So um, we see that in several places where, you know, God is just declaring, hey, this is good. Okay, so that's somewhat of a picture of uh, defining goodness for us. Uh, let's now, uh, number two, talk about the goodness of God specifically. And the reason why we have to talk about the goodness of God specifically is that the standard that we will use, that we need to use, that we should always use to know whether something is good, the standard has to be God, right? So when we look at the goodness of God, uh, you know, that is always, uh, that needs to be the measure. That needs to be how we weigh and figure it out. Uh, if we, we want to tell uh, if we're good, we don't want to compare ourselves to someone else, right? Well, hey, three rows behind me, I know how they live. I, I'm gooder than them, right? Or I, I know my neighbor, I'm certainly more good than my neighbor, Right? We don't want to get into this thing of, of, of trying to uh, let ourselves off the hook with whatever level of goodness because the Lord wants to bring more of that fruit in our lives. And the way for us to really measure whether there even is that fruit in our lives is to measure against what he says and, and what he shows us. Right? You, you know, it, th this is such an important point on so many ways. And, and one of the ways is, you, you know, in America, uh, in, in just in general, the, the pulse of our nation, if you ask people, what is the way to heaven? You know, it comes, it comes out something like this. Well, if my good deeds on the scale are, are outweighing my bad deeds in life, then I'm going to take the escalator up. And surely I got more good deeds than uh, I'll be higher up on the list that I just got to be one up in front of the person behind me, you know? Uh, and and that, is, that is so nowhere in scripture, right? That is not, the, the, the Bible picture is there's no one righteous, not even one. You, you know, we all need a savior, and, and so in that picture there, we need to make sure that as we walk out this journey as disciples, as followers of Christ, that we let him be the standard and we don't start to look to the world around us, especially in light of the fact that, that more than ever, we're, we're in a world with so much uh, mixed up messages and even more so, we have more access to all those messages through social media and, and, and all the, the different avenues that we have. So we need to make sure that that it's, it's God who is the standard. He is the author of goodness, so it makes sense that he's the one that we would go to. So a couple of verses here, uh, they, they mostly speak for themselves, just make a comment or two, but talking about the goodness of God. Uh, Psalm 25 verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. That's, that's, that's a thing that's really been standing out to me lately. I've mentioned it in a few of the last messages that I've done, this idea of the way. You know, uh, believers in the book of Acts, they were, they were called followers of the way. You know, God's way. It, it was different than anything they were seeing around them because of what had been furnished and provided in Christ. You know, the, the new covenant in Christ was showing this picture. This is the way. Followers of the way. Really what it's saying is followers of God's way. But his way is good and upright. And he teaches sinners how to walk in that way, which is finding eternal life, finding forgiveness of sin, finding hope, walking in every good purpose that he has for us. Can you say amen? 
uh, Psalm 27, 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's encouragement, it's hope for our lives, the goodness of the Lord uh, as we see it uh, in the world. Psalm 31, 19, oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you uh, in the presence of the sons of men. That is so awesome here in this psalm. Oh, how great is your goodness. And notice here, we're getting more of a picture painted out on on how we walk in that goodness, how that fruit gets worked out in our lives. It, It is laid up for those who fear you. That is, those who walk in reverential awe and respect of you. And then those who uh, not only uh, reverence and fear you, but those who trust in you. Right? So those are two more scriptural pointers for us on on how do we walk out God's goodness in our lives. Psalm 33, verse 5, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Psalm 68.10, your congregation dwelt in it. You, O God, provided from your goodness for the poor. And then one more and we'll we'll get to our next point. Psalm 107 verse 8, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Right, to have our eyes. I, I, was, uh, I, didn't, I didn't jot the quote down, but as I was preparing, I saw a, a quote from uh, John Wesley, and he was talking about a guy uh, who, who was kind of pushed back against Wesley as he was sharing about the goodness of God. You know, and, uh, you know, he basically was saying, but there's all these issues and all this stuff going on in my life. And, and Wesley had uh, uh, said, and, and I think as, as they, were, they were traveling along, there was a wall and there was a cow, uh, but there was a hole in the wall and the cow had his head poked through the wall. And he called his attention to that and said, you know, uh, you're not seeing the goodness of God because the wall of your issues are what's in front of you. You got to get over the wall. You got to get above the wall, and then you'll be able to see the bigger picture of the goodness of God. I thought, oh man, that's a good way to put it, right? Because we could get so wrapped up. What, what God is saying in that is you may be experiencing stuff, but my goodness is bigger than the stuff, right? And that's why looking back at these scriptures, we can have hope and we can be encouraged. Okay, so uh, moving into some of what we're talking about here, uh, why is goodness then so important? Well, number one, we were created in Christ for good works. Now, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, I want to point out, this is Ephesians 2.10. So often we quote Ephesians 2.9 which is that, uh, you know, basically tells us that uh, uh, salvation is not by works. You know, it's, uh, we are saved um, uh, by faith through, through God's grace, and it's not by works. And, and that is a, a verse that we know so well, and it's important for us to know because, yes, our works can't save us. That's where we started the sermon, right, this morning. But on the other side, the very next verse reminds us for, you know, so you're saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. It's not by your works so no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So again, the Lord is saying, don't throw the goodness of God being worked out through you. Don't throw it out. Just realize you can't, you're, you can't work your way into his goodness. You have to receive it. You got to uh, humbly uh, call on him as Lord and Savior. Let him make you brand new, and then he'll work that out in our lives. So we're created in Christ for good works, number one. And number two, uh, we're called to imitate what is good. Third John 1, 11, dear friends, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. All right, number three, we're called to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And remember, we want the world to see him in us and through us and all of our imperfections as human beings, right? The, the world can still very clearly see the Lord through us. Uh, Colossians 1.10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen.
All right, and then number four, uh, let's talk now, in light of all of this that we just looked at, uh, displaying God's goodness. So, so display God's goodness. And the verse uh, that, that's the memory verse for this week is 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So uh, we are to abound and display goodness to the world around us. You know, it was interesting, uh, again, as I was preparing, I saw somebody... uh, you know, teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. I was reading some stuff, and I just thought this was an interesting thought. He said, okay, so our first three, uh, love, joy, peace, you know, then we have uh, patience, kindness, goodness. You know, love, joy, peace, uh, those are... um, those are inward fruit. Now, now an, argument, an argument can be made for what I'm about to say that these are all, all of these things. But I think what he was leaning into is those, those, those work on us inwardly. You know, I'm experiencing God's love. Pastor Ralph made a really great point last week when he said, boy, those first three, they almost kind of just drop on you with fruit on the tree already when you first get saved. You know, oh, the love of God. Oh, the peace that has come. I feel such joy. I'm saved. Right? That's so often, you know, our testimony when we've come to Christ. Oh, my sins are washed away. What peace, what joy. Oh, the love of God. And then Pastor Ralph commented, but then, you you know, these other six that we look at, there's some working out in our lives. There's some breaking up the ground and there's some uh, effort that needs to go in. Now, now, right, where did we start off saying, not our effort to make it happen, but our effort to cooperate with what he's doing in our lives. But this guy had said, so these first three are inward. The ones that we're looking at uh, now, uh, so love, joy, peace, uh, patience, kindness, goodness, those are working outward. And then the last three that we'll look at, um, they, they are upward toward the Lord. So I thought, I thought you, you know what, again, these are all, all of those. But I, I thought there was something to what he said there. And in particular now, talking about goodness, the goodness of God is such a powerful testimony. It is such a powerful preaching to the world around us. When, when people see, because what they see is a changed life. They see people doing not what the rest of the world typically does. Right? Even when we talked about love your enemies and bless those that curse you, Scripture even tells us it's easy to be nice to those who are being nice to us. It's easy to bless those that are blessing us. But what sets us apart where people will see something different, the goodness of God in us, is when we are loving people that are not expressing lovingness back toward us, right? Right? And that is a picture of what God has done for the world while we were still enemies, while we were still sinners, right? Christ died for us. So we display God's goodness. Uh, Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Uh, Just to put it real plain, that same verse in New Living Translation, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So he's working in us to work his goodness out. 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let, let me also pause here too. Let's make sure that when we're, you know, how many times in this message have I said work or works? Lots and lots and lots of times. Let's make sure that we, again, define that word that's not just like I went and I served in the food pantry uh, or, you know, I worked in the clothing room and I did a good work for somebody in need. How many know good works, it's just, it's fruit that's to be pouring out of our life all day long. It, it, we could really just simplify it this way. Good work is just displaying the goodness of God towards somebody else. In, in any capacity, in any capacity, it could be on the road, it could be in the store, it could be in a conversation, and, and, uh, and then certainly in our homes, right? That's where we want to uh, live it most, right? Is to make sure that those that know us best uh, are, are seeing uh, our life submitted to Holy Spirit so that fruit is coming out in our lives. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And, and you know, this is another verse that I use quite a bit in my messages, but the Lord, uh, I so love when the Lord nudges you on stuff. Have you ever had that happen? You're reading or you're thinking, and the Lord nudged me like, go back to the front end of that verse. Let us consider. 
And I thought, okay, that it's not just a, a statement. Um, spur one another on toward love and good deeds, if, if you happen to think about it. It's no, let's stop and consider how might I hmm, spur others on toward love and good deeds. Lord, let me give this some thought. Let me pray. Let me listen for your voice. Let me, you know, work through this with you on how you want to see your goodness displayed through me so it can spur others on in the right direction. Come on, can you say amen? I mean, that right there on, a, again, trying to hit this from a 360 degree view uh, of this, this fruit of goodness. That, that could be, for, for some of us this morning, the one point that we walk away with, Lord, I'm going to consider, how can I spur my family on toward love and good deeds? Let me consider that with the Lord. What does it look like in my home? What does it look like in my marriage? What does it look like in, in the, the workplace? What does it look like when I'm at church on Sunday? You know, this is something, and I, and I want to say right off the bat, thanks be to God, this is not a characteristic of the church family here at the Church of Grace and Peace. But it, it, I heard it said uh, about the body of Christ in general, about the, the, you know, the army of God, that we're the only army that leave our wounded behind. You know, and, and uh, like I said, I, I thank God that that is not the picture of what you see day in and day out here in this church family. But I, I only share that to say that that is uh, a caution and a reminder, uh, boy, that we can get our eyes off of what is the main thing. The main thing is to bear fruit, right? Is to know him and then out of that, that fruit come out of our lives. So to live in a way to think that that's, that's what's pleasing to the Lord, that I can, I can consider how to spur others on toward love and good deeds. And let me even take a step further and let me invite, can you think back in your life what it meant to you? I, I know I can for me in so many places, so many different situations where love and encouragement and somebody spurring you on uh, where, where that was, somebody blessed you with that. They cheered you on. They, 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 they showed the love of God. Did you ever have a time? I mean, I look back at um, my heart is so, so soft toward the youth pastor. Uh, he was, I was the, I'm, I'm trying to think about how to can not make it like a 10 minute story here. Uh, 19 years old, come to Christ, and the youth pastor up at my old church at Calvary Temple takes Annette and I under his wing uh, to be youth leaders, knowing that we're trying to discern and walk out uh, a ministry calling. And as I look back at my time serving him, like I was the worst. I had to be, and he never said that to me, but I look back as I've learned and grown, and I even apologized. I saw him years later because he went off into missions, and I met up with him, and I'm just like, I just want to say I'm sorry, man, because I'm, I'm realizing now how awful of a leader I was on your team, you know, but he, he spurred me on toward love, toward good works. He, he didn't, he saw past what I needed to grow past and encouraged me to go in the direction that would be the direction. God wants for me. Can you say amen? Right? And we all have situations and thank God for those, those moments. But what happens, man, when the body of Christ embraces that call? You know, what we see in Hebrews, right? Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I tell you what, we live with this as a priority. How are people going to be able to stay away? You know, and, and that's the picture. We want to be a life-giving place. And we are. I'm talking about us going on into the, the fullness of what God has for us there. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Uh, Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. All right, I'll go down to uh, Galatians 6.10. Therefore... Sorry, in the booth, I just skipped past two, two verses there. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Yeah, how many know that goes so against the flesh, right? Somebody comes by and cuts us off, and now the flesh just says, I feel like I want to cut someone off. Doesn't even have to be that person, right? It's just it's so so uh, foolish how how the the flesh, you know, that that battle that we have. But thank God we have Holy Spirit living on the inside, 
right? And he is the greater one. Greater is he that is in me than he who was influencing the world and, and you know, all that's fallen in it. So, hey, as we come in for a landing here, I just, I, I want to uh, just call our attention. Let, let's pray in just a minute. And hopefully as we uh, did this kind of a 360 degree view of looking at goodness, let, let me call us back to where, where, you know, we started here. So it all comes out of the work of God's spirit in our lives as we yield to him. But, you know, oftentimes if, if we're honest and we look at our lives, we could see that we compartmentalize. You know, maybe we could say, well, okay, walking in God's goodness in this arena, it's much easier here, but it's, it's not so easy over in this setting. You know, so it's not like a yes or no question. Am I walking in the goodness of God? Or maybe if we want to quantify, all right, on a scale of one to 10, how much is this fruit in my life? 10 is like, wow, look at all that fruit. And 10 is like, that's a fruit tree, you, you know? Uh, but oftentimes we would say, well, it's a, it's a five here, it's a seven here, it's a nine there, it's a one there, you know? And, and I'm just, I'm sharing that so that we can um, allow Holy Spirit to put his finger on areas that he would want to work in our lives. I got to tell you, I've been carrying with, with uh, the other pastors as well, such a, a burden and a heart uh, for marriages, uh, knowing that it's, it's been uh, life in general is just difficult, not to mention when personal things come and hit. Um, so there's been such a burden, a prayer burden, and uh, that this is a great, great time for us to say, okay, fruit of the Spirit. Am I allowing, am I yielding to God so that his fruit can pour out of my life in my marriage? Or maybe it's in my home, you, you know, whatever the setting, whatever your, your life station is. And, you know, in the home is the hardest place to live it because uh, it's the people that know us best, that they get under our skin sometimes the most. Can we be honest? Hey, we get under their skin the most, if we could be honest, right? It's the place really where, you know, we're called in our faith to take up our cross and follow him. And it's the place where we're given that opportunity. But if we'll recognize that, it, the, there will be, uh, how, many, how many know what I'm talking about here? There will be a breaking that happens. But I don't mean a breaking like the world where you need a doctor. I'm talking about like a brokenness where the fragrance of Christ is really, released in our life. And then God is given room to heal. And God has given room to push out the places where the enemy has been coming in and trying to rob and steal. And, and certainly what I'm talking about here, it can be, and you, you pick whatever arena, but I, I, I'm just asking this morning, is there a place where, you know, maybe we want to say, uh, Lord, I really need to repent because I've not leaned on you and your fruit to be working out in my life, I've been trying to lean on the arm of the flesh, you know? And then I really felt prompted in first service and then to, to come back with this in second service, uh, we, we looked at a verse that talked about uh, from Psalms about God's goodness being stored up for those who trust him. But before that it said, but for those who have reverential awe of the Lord. And so I, I wanna say it this way, the guardian of goodness in our own life and walk with God is always going to be maintaining reverential awe, respect, that, that kind of fear of the Lord. Can you say amen? I don't think I shared this in the message. I think it was in a small group, but I was, I was really impacted by a, a statement uh, regarding Jim Baker. If you remember Jim Baker and PTL and there was a big scandal and all kinds of awful uh, stuff that he was responsible for that he did, he wound up going to prison. Uh, but glory to God, he, he was broken, he repented, and, and he was fully restored. God brought him back from all that because he repented and he took God's road back. But he was interviewed. And in, in the interview, the person said, uh, what happened? Did, did you lose your love for God? And he said, I never lost my love for God. I lost my reverence for God. And when that went out, everything else got distorted. So if we want to have a clear picture of what the love of God looks like, a clear picture of walking in the goodness of God. See, reverential fear 
And you understand for, for anybody, that's not fear or terror, like I'm afraid of him, but that's, I have such respect and you're so awesome and you're so holy that, that uh, I'm not playing games with you, God, right? Reverence takes away all game playing, right? Any, anything that we allow uh, because we've fooled ourselves uh, goes out when it goes in the light of uh, reverence and respect for the Lord. So with that, just again, as we get ready to close and pray, uh, is, is it possible around the room, you know, there, there are folks here that just need to say, you know what, I need to repent because I lost my reverence for God and it, it's affecting his fruit in my life. Have I allowed my sense of God's love for me to be kind of like a, a grandpa rather than a father? How I know what I'm talking about, you can get away with crazy stuff with grandparents, right? You know, but, but and, and then the children of, of the parents that are grandparents say, you are not the person that raised me. Why is it this way, right? You know, that's why, you know, you, you'll hear a preacher say sometimes, God isn't a grandfather. You, you know, he's, he's got to be your father, you know, and as a father, it's direct uh, accountability to him. So could it be that there's some even this morning that are saying, you know what, Lord, I, yeah, I get my eyes back on you and how awesome and, and and, and just awe-inspiring you are, that will cause my picture of goodness, picture of what's evil, what's right, what's wrong, that will cause that to become so much clearer. You know, because again, what do we see here? Holy Spirit will give us the desire and the power to walk in what's right, to walk in his goodness. In church, how many of you know that, that then we will shine? We will be a, a city on a hill. Shine before people that they could see your good works. Sometimes the good works is that you're not participating just in what everybody around you is participating in. Sometimes that's the good work. And that can shout louder than any sermon I or anybody else could ever preach, right? That's the gospel being preached without even using words. Amen. So would you close your eyes? Bow your heads with me just as we wrap up. And just wherever the Lord has uh, put his finger on, you just in your own place, in your own way, just have your own prayer to him now. And, and I'll lead out as well. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We love you so much. God, we thank you so much for salvation. And, and just uh, around the room this morning, if there's anybody here and, and you've heard me talking about uh, being born again, talk about uh, um, being, you know, recreated, bring, being a new creature, uh, all the stuff that I've said about what salvation is, if you've not confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, then, then you come to this altar at the end of the service and, and I'll be here, meet with me, let's pray. Uh, you become saved when you personally confess and receive what Jesus did for the whole world. When you say, I believe it and I call you Lord and Savior now, that's when you become born again. And I would love the honor to pray with anybody here that has not yet done that. But Lord, uh, around the room, Lord, we first say thank you for salvation. Thank you that salvation means that your Holy Spirit has taken up residence in our, in our hearts. And God, we thank you that uh, in a world that is so confused and, and groaning with no compass, God, we thank you that you have given us the standard of what is good, of what, of what is evil. You are our standard. And so as we've looked at this message this morning, we soften our hearts, we humble our hearts. And Lord, we do say that we want to, to bear much fruit for your glory. We want people to see you in us. And Lord, we do say, start with those who know us best. Lord, wherever we need to, we say we repent for any time where they've gotten the leftovers rather than the first part. And Lord, wherever we have lost reverence and awe for you, Lord, please forgive us. Lord, wherever we have allowed justifying, wherever we have made the standard 
the, the person near us or the, uh, some other standard than you, wherever we're not walking out and we know it, Lord, we just say we repent in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God, that this goodness you've called us to walk out is something that we first get to experience. It's to us, and then you desire it to flow through us. So we receive your goodness this morning. We receive your love. We receive your forgiveness. And thank you, God. We pray that in these days to come, that there would be lasting fruit. Lord, you've, you've broken it into these nine different aspects of it. But in what we've looked at so far, thank you for love. And then out of that love, joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And then all that we'll look at in these next three weeks here. So God, we commit ourselves into your hands. Lord, we submit to you. We, we are willing to wrestle through and align with you and cooperate with you. But we just go on record acknowledging that it's as we're submitted to you and it's you doing the work. And so once again, Lord, we say, and you get all the glory. God, all this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. All God's people said, amen. 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 Bless you, Lord.